Well, good evening. It's good to have each one of you tuning in with us this evening. Uh, we like to try to show our Facebook Live uh, Wednesday night service here at 7 o'clock. And, and tonight we've had, we've had some difficulties with our technology, and we're trying to work out some of those bugs. So we, we don't have music today, but we will be, we'll be looking at the Word, and we'll be praying. And so I just encourage you to join together with us. There's a couple of things I wanted to make you aware of. Uh, tomorrow morning, we are going to have a Bible study in my office at 10 o'clock, and, and anybody that I can find in and around the office is going to join me. And then I just wanted to remind you also, on Tuesday, we've been having a food distribution. And this last week, again, we served over 30 families. So we appreciate everyone who has been donating for that, uh, the purchase of the food we are able to buy just hundreds of pounds of food for just just a small amount of money, uh, but we have we have run short of our funds. So if if you want to contribute towards that, that would be helpful. We appreciate that, uh, and those thirty families that we've been able to make connection with that's that's been good for them as well. Uh, also, I just wanted to make you aware of our prayer request. If if you have a particular need that you want the congregation to know about, if you just would call the the prayer line at the church. Uh, we will make sure that we include that in our prayer list or on the website at hernaz.org. There's a, a, a place where you can, you can submit a prayer request there as well as, as well as giving online. And if you, if you need, if you're not finding email in your box this week, then you want to be on the email list. Uh, make sure you contact the office. We can get you on the email list or the prayer list, or if you don't have a computer or something and you'd, you'd rather have a hard copy mailed to you, we can, we can even accommodate you that way. So uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Walt if he would come and lead us as we, as we pray and uh, prepare our hearts as we, we look at the Word and we think of, of the needs that we have represented in our congregation. Shall we pray? Father, we come to you tonight. Uh, we are needy people. First of all, we want you to know we love you. With all our heart, we're here to serve you, to give you the best of our service. And even though we're apart, we, we can't be together like we'd like to be, you know, and you're with us, and you, you know everybody's heart. And so we, we are praying tonight that wherever our people are, in their homes, be with each one, comfort us all, let us know that you're with us, you're there, and that you're going to bring us back. This too shall pass. We will come back together soon. Thank you, Father, for the miracles that you perform in our lives and continue to work and, and make it happen. Help us to just have faith, to trust you, to know that it's there. Lord, we know that there are a number of our people that are hurting today. And Lord, we just bring them to you. Uh, there's a, a many physical needs that uh, they need a touch from you. So we ask you to go near them. Uh, let them know that you're there to comfort them. You're there to touch their bodies and to help them to through, go through it. We thank you, Lord, that none of our, uh, our people at this point have con contacted the virus. And so we just uh, continue to say thank you for that. and and pray that, that, that we'll continue to go on without it, Father. Now, Lord, we, we're trying in this interim to trust you, so help us to do our best to serve you. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, um, we remember that, that it was 4,000 years after the first promise came that, that God was going to send a deliverer, a Messiah, a Savior, and I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. And so the idea of waiting very long um, just, just makes me uncomfortable because I'm, I'm, like many of you, not just a naturally patient person. So the idea of waiting 4,000 years is, is just unbearable to think, think of waiting that long. But, but we need to sometimes be reminded uh, and keep things in perspective that when God began to move, when he saw the need that, that we had uh, here in this world— um, he was patient, and he was willing to wait those 4,000 years uh, to send Jesus. And it was at the right time that Jesus came. 
And so when Jesus was finally born and, and all the angels were singing and celebrating and the shepherd and the wise men were, were coming to worship and, and on in the temple and Mary was singing and everybody was rejoicing and celebrating, uh, all this excitement, when Jesus finally came, it was another 30 years before he actually uh, began his ministry. And, and so sometimes we have to think about the, the, the patience and having the patience to, to wait upon God and wait upon God's perfect timing. Um, well, then when Jesus finally does begin his ministry, and that's what I want us to look at this evening, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, uh, we see that Jesus goes to his cousin's church. He goes out to the river church, and that's where John the Baptist is holding services. And John the Baptist makes this big announcement, you know, there he is. He's the one, the one we've been looking for, the one we've been waiting for, the one I've been talking about, the Lamb of God. And, and you know, one observation that I can make before we get into the scripture here is, you know, this passage really illustrates that God doesn't operate with Lone Ranger Christians in his kingdom. God wants all of us together, working together. And we see here is Jesus the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, submitting to earthly authority. I mean, this is, this is really remarkable when you think about it, that Jesus is willing to submit himself to, to his cousin uh, to, to be baptized in, in, this, in this river. Um, and, and we in our church, we recognize two sacraments. We recognize baptism. We recognize the, the Lord's Supper, or sometimes we call it communion or Eucharist. And, and we recognize that these sacraments can't be done alone. We need the community of faith. We need one another in order to participate in these sacraments. Uh, you can't have communion by yourself. I mean, it, it just violates what that word means, communion. Um, you, you can't be baptized by yourself. It requires the covenant people of God. And, and we see here is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, we see the Son of God humbling himself and submitting himself to, to work together in God's plan, in God's time, in God's way. And, and this requires unity. Unity in the body of Christ, unity in the family of God, unity in God's covenant people. Unity is necessary for the church. And the American church, unfortunately, is not very united. We call ourselves the United States of America, but... But there's not a lot of unity in America, it seems, today. And we look in the world, we look in politics, and we say, oh, look at them, they're, they're terrible, how divided they are and how div divisive they are. But are we really any different in the church? Unfortunately, I'm afraid that, that we don't have the kind of unity that I think God desires for us to have as followers of Jesus. Um, we need the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit works when, when people are united together. And, and when we are not united, uh, we don't see the manifestation, manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our midst, working with, with us. And I think it was a South Korean pastor, uh, Paul Cho, who visited America, and he made these remarks. He said, it's amazing how much the church in America can accomplish without the Holy Spirit. You just think about that for a moment. How much of what we do each and every day can we accomplish, do we do, without our dependence upon God, without totally relying upon Him to move? God, if, if you don't come, if you don't move, then, then I'm not going. God, if you don't come and you don't move, then we're not going to see what you want to see accomplished occur right in this place. One of my um, you know, favorite writers, N.T. Wright, I can hardly read all that he writes, um, but he's a an Anglican bishop, um, he's a professor, he's, he's probably the best, uh, best known theologian, I think, in, in the world today. And he was visiting America, and, and he's a, a scholar in, in New Testament studies, and in particular when Paul wrote a biography of Paul here recently, and, and they were asking him um, a question. They said, if the Apostle Paul was here in America today, what do you suppose the Apostle Paul would say to the American church? And N.T. Wright said uh, he would be appalled at the lack of unity 
in the American church, but, but not so much just with the lack of unity, but, but he would be appalled, he would be shocked at our not just lack of unity, but our, our uh, lack of concern for our lack of unity. Uh, it just doesn't seem to bother us. Uh, we, see, we see unity in the New Testament church is a huge thing. Um, this is a, a top priority, and we're constantly being called to being united together as God's people. And yet too often in our churches, we find people bickering and fussing with each other, and we just see that as kind of normal, everyday Christian life. Um, we find local churches that can't get along even in a small community. They can't seem to work together. They can't seem to partner together. And we all seem to be fighting over, you know, one another's people. You know, we don't want to lose our people to another church. Um, it's really a shame to behold the lack of unity that exists. And, and I don't think it's a big surprise that there's, with this lack of unity, a lack of manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our churches. Okay, that's just uh, the introduction to what I want to talk about, in, and that is Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. When Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he receives this affirmation, he receives this validation from his heavenly Father. A voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. I like that translation, that, that understanding that, that we bring joy to the Father, that, that when, when the Father looks at Jesus, it brings joy to him. And when, when the Father looks at us as, as being connected to Christ, we also bring joy to him. Um, I have a good daughter-in-law that is very thoughtful for me. She takes photos of my grandchildren and she will send them to me. And this afternoon, I received about three photos from my for my daughter-in-law in, in Kansas and my two grandkids walking along and, and I just look at them. I don't even know what they're doing, but I just look at them and I smile. It brings joy to me to just see them and, and to think about our Heavenly Father. When He looks at us, we, we put a smile on His face. He's excited to, to have His kids doing what, what we are doing and, and trying our best to follow Jesus. Um, it brings joy to him. But I, I, I want to make some points here, three points, because every sermon is supposed to have three points. Um, so three points here that I want to make, but, but each one of these points are going to begin with the same phrase. When I know who I am, I will not be dot, dot, dot. So here's, here's my three points. Jesus starts his ministry by being led in the Holy Spirit. Um, that sounds great, right? I want to be led by the Holy Spirit, and Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't have Jesus go to the church and stand up in front of everybody and perform some incredible miracles. He doesn't sing a song. He doesn't preach a great sermon. He doesn't heal anybody. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus not in front of everybody, but the Holy Spirit leads Jesus to the wilderness. <laughs> now, we've been waiting 4,000 years. We were waiting 30 years, and now he finally, we finally see Jesus is is kind of announcing the beginning of his ministry, and he goes off into the wilderness. What in the world is going on? The wilderness is a, is a place for purification. The wilderness, you remember when, when God had Moses lead the children of Abraham, he, he had them lead them out of slavery in Egypt, and they went through the wilderness. And the wilderness was a time of testing. The wilderness was a time of of now that they've been set free from Egypt, it's a time for them to get Egypt out of them. And, and, and the wilderness is a time for purification. It's time for us to purify ourselves through the Holy Spirit and to get, to get right with God. And this happens through testing. It happens through sometimes trials. In Matthew 4, 3, uh, during that time, the devil came to him. Now, you remember, the Holy Spirit's the one leading Jesus all the way. And during that time, the devil comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Oh, isn't that great? So not only is Jesus led out into the wilderness, but now the devil comes on the scene. God's ways are not always our ways, are they? Um, but the first thing the devil comes to do is try to discredit Jesus and his identity. You remember Jesus was just, informed and affirmed of who he was and 
and, and God expressed his pleasure upon Jesus. And here, here comes the devil and he says, if you really are, authority, power, gifting can really be abused if you don't have your identity securely understood and, 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 and seated within you. When I know who I am, then I can be used effectively by God. The problem comes when, when I don't know who I am, then, then I tend to stray off of God's path. And so this is my first point. When I know who I am, I will not be performance-driven. When, when I know who I am, I will not be performance-driven. Uh, I had an opportunity a few years back to take a sabbatical. And, and, and I stepped back from ministry for a few weeks, and I visited other churches. I spent time you know, not trying to minister to anybody and just trying to unwind and focus my attention upon God. And I, I had some books that I was reading and some scripture I'd, I'd spend you know, meditating on some scripture and just getting away um, to, to sort of reconnect with God in, in a fresh way. Um, and while I was doing that, I, I came across a book uh, by Pete Scazzaro, and Scazzaro's book was entitled Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I started reading that um, when Stephanie and I were traveling. We were actually in uh, Arizona at the time. And I started reading it. And the next day I said, Stephanie, you've got to read this book with me. You've got to read. This is, this is speaking to where, where our people are. This is speaking to where we are. We need this book. And we need to share this book with others. Um, because he talks about his own life, this Pete Scazzaro as a pastor in, in, in Queens, and he'd been a missionary and, and done all kinds of incredible work for God, and he planted this church in, in the New York City area, and it had grown to a 1,000. And, and it, from the outside, it looked like he was just doing a fantastic job. God was blessing his ministry. But on the inside, when he was honest with himself, his marriage wasn't where it needed to be. The relationship wasn't right. And, and, and the reason that he was doing some of the things he was doing was, was not based out of his security and his own identity. It was based upon performance. He wanted to please his dad. He wanted to please his mother. He wanted to please his, his, his church leaders because he had lost focus on who he was in Christ. Psalm 37, verse 25 and 26 said, uh, David says, once I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the godly abandoned nor the children begging for bread. The godly always give generous loans to others and their children are a blessing. Uh, Philippians 4.19, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, these men, David and the Apostle Paul, had experienced some difficult times. And yet, in the face of difficult times, they were able to, to write these words, to pen these words. God takes care of us, his children. And just as he takes care of us out of his glorious riches, he wants to take care of you as well. And the devil challenges Jesus. If you are the Son of God, then turn these stones to bread. Well, the truth is Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, and Jesus is the bread of life. And, and Satan's trying to come at him about his identity, and Jesus doesn't fall for it. We see in, in uh, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 4 how the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you are the Son of God, jump off. For the Scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Isn't it kind of interesting that the devil knows the scriptures? The devil knows the Bible. And, and that's why it's really important for us to, to know it better than the devil, to know it in context. Because what the devil's done here is he's pulled scripture out of context and, and tried to put God, tried to put Jesus to the test. Ben Witherington, um, a New Testament scholar, says a text without a context is just a pretext for what you want it to mean. A text without a context is just a pretext for what we want it to mean. So we can pull it out of context and, and twist Scripture and make it say what we want it to say, but we've got to read Scripture in its, in its context, in its whole. 
And if we read it in its context and we soak ourselves in it, we'll, we'll avoid these doctrinal errors that, that plague so many who call themselves Christians. And here again, Satan, he's trying to tempt Jesus with the word, but Jesus is the word. And so this is my second point. When I know who I am, I will not be arrogant. When I know who I am, I will not be arrogant. We don't need to test the Lord. We don't need to prove our faith. We don't need to jump off and, and see that God is good and God is faithful and God is true to his word. God is good and God is faithful and God is true to his word, whether we test him or not. We need to operate by faith. And, and it's arrogance to, to, to run around and try to put God to the test in this way. Pride comes before the fall, scriptures tell us. Matthew 4, verses 8 and 9, we see that next the devil took him to a peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. So here's my final point. When I know who I am, I will not be selfish. When I know who, when I, know who I am, I will not be selfish. The enemy is trying to, trying to tempt Jesus with cheap worship. The Bible tells us that worship is costly. Worship requires sacrifice. There's a story in, in Samuel where, where David is offered some land for free to build the temple of God. And David refuses to accept this land for free because he recognizes that worship that's offered to God is costly. And I will not offer to God something that costs me nothing. And that's a mentality that we need to have as worshipers of God, that worship involves sacrifice, that worship is costly. And so Jesus tells Satan, you get lost, get out of here. I'm tired of talking to you. Hit the road, Jack. Don't you come back. No more, no more, no more, no more. Hit the road, Jack. Um, we don't sing that song in, in church too often. But that's what, that's what Jesus is saying to Satan. Get out of here. I've had enough of you. I'm not worshiping you. I know who I am. I am accepted by, by God, my Father. I bring him joy. I am following his word. I'm doing his will. When I know who I am, I can rest in this kind of confidence. I don't, I don't have to be arrogant. I don't have to be selfish. I can be the most generous person around. Generosity comes from, from people who know who they are, that, that these possessions, they're not mine. They're my father's, and, and I'm merely a steward of them, and I'm, I'm, merely, I'm merely a, a conduit blessing others with, with what God has given me first. When I know who I am, when I, when I recognize that I'm a child of the king, then I can become the most generous person there is. I can have this kind of confidence to be a follower of Christ, and it doesn't matter what kind of car I drive. It doesn't matter what kind of clothes I wear or the house I live in. When I'm a follower of Jesus and I know that I bring joy to my Father, then it frees me to follow him and worship him un uninhibited. Some of you probably know the song, My Father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing, All glory to God, I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king a child of the king. With Jesus, my savior, I'm a child of the king. I just want to encourage you this evening uh, in the midst of, of what we're dealing with, in the frustration of what, what might be going on in your life. Um, some of you are facing some, some challenges with your own health and, and others are, have burdens that you're carrying about your family members, about friends that, that maybe aren't right with God. Some of you are just frustrated because you're, you're lonely. You, you haven't had an opportunity to be with others. Um, let me remind you uh, to, to look back 
at what God's word says about who you are as a follower of Jesus, as, as a child of God, as a son or a daughter of the king, um, you can have confidence and, and you can have a peace that, that passes all understanding in the midst of all that you're going through. Let me encourage you to seek, seek that by, by knowing who you are in Christ. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that we find that comes from the living word of God. And, and you know the situation that, that each one is going through who's tuning in tonight. We just pray that, that through your Holy Spirit, you might speak to them. And, and we, we pray for our church that this is sort of a, a, a testing time for us, a sort of a time in the wilderness for us. But God, I pray that through this time of testing, through this difficulty, that we can be purified, that we can be, that we can be re-energized, that we can be uh, reset in our, in our love and our attention, our focus for you. Help us, God, to continue to keep our eyes fixed upon you, to hear your words as you speak truth to us, that we are your sons, we are your daughters, and you're well pleased with us. We bring joy to you. Father, we thank you for your word, your words of encouragement. And I pray that, that as we continue on the rest of this evening and, and, and through the rest of the week, God, may your hand of blessing be with us through your presence of your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen.